interview is being conducted for St John Scotland, 75 years of making a difference. My name is Dr Sue Morrison and the respondent is Keith Sterling. This is October the 6th, 2021 and the interview is taking place in Keith's home. Thank you very much for agreeing to be interviewed for this project, Keith. For the record, would you please confirm your name? William Keith Sterling. And what is your age or just your year of birth? 1942. Thank you. Where were you brought up, Keith? Initially in London, up until 1955. Then we returned to Whitburn in West Lothian. Can you tell me about your early life? Well, uh, I had the opportunity of going to the John Ruskin School, living in South East Five, and um, at that particular time you had to be involved with the Cadet Corps. And I ended up uh, attending Wellington College, which was Wellington Barracks at that particular time, and then latterly at Woolwich, uh, polishing bridle ray on a Saturday morning uh, for Royal Horse uh, Artillery, uh, which I eventually took part in Her Majesty's coronation as I was an, a sand boy on the back of a Waterloo cannon going down Whitehall in 1953. And then we moved, uh, well, 55, 54, I beg your pardon, we moved back to uh, Whitburn in West Lothian. Uh, Is that where your parents are from? My parents, yeah, from Whitburn in West Lothian, yeah. And why did they return there? My mum was a bit homesick and wanted to get back, and her parents were rather infirm at that particular time. Uh, so. What age were you then? I was... Uh, <laughs> Was it a bit of a shock returning to Scotland? Uh, it was uh, for me because uh, when I went to school, be, being at the John Ruskin, you had a, a blazer, a cap and short trousers and a school bag. So when I attended the local school, I was somewhat upmarket uh, because the, the order of the day for a school bag was a gas mask bag. And they wore tackety boots and long trousers, so I was a sort of the subject of a relative element of bullying, if you like. But then that was the sort of thing that happened in those days. What did you do after school? I went to. What did I do after school? Hmm. And what? And what way? What for work? For what? Well, I started my apprenticeship with a company called Clyde Crane and Moss End in Lanarkshire. Uh, as a design engineer, and I'd done my uh, HNC at uh, Coatbridge Technical College, and then I'd done the Institute of Structurals at uh, Glasgow Royal Technical College, and I had the, the good fortune of working with a, a wonderful engineer uh, in Glasgow by the name of Hugh Fraser, and Hugh designed the Benny Monorail in 1929, and it was to run from the Bella Houston Park to the opening of the Kelvin Hall in 1935. Um, he wrote a paper to the structurals uh, on graphical integration as applied to uh, two pin arch portal frames. And I'd done my paper on graphical integration as applied to microwave towers. And I got involved in all sorts of projects there. Uh, we done the uh, guide masters for the Apollo space project uh, way back on Ascension Island and then my, one of my interesting projects was the Bristol City floodlighting tours uh, and I always remember they had set one of the tours up in the wrong position and it was beginning to take a twist because it hadn't been levelled properly so I had to go out to Bristol to have a look at the thing and when I went to the secretary's office on the Monday morning, they said, we weren't expecting you. I said, what do you mean? He says, well, the Vanguard flight from Edinburgh crashed in the fog and all passengers were killed. Well, I said, really? And I had missed that flight and I managed to get a standby flight on an old DC-9 out of Glasgow, uh, right into Bristol, straight into Bristol Airport. So that, that, was, my, that was my call, <laughs> I suppose. It was one of the things. Then in, in 1968, um, I started up my own company in fabrication, welding, materials handling, all that sort of stuff. Being a principal contractor to uh, the Caterpillar Tractor Company, Cameron Ironworks, 
FMC Corporation, Allstate's Clipper, and the Tesco Corporation, Calgary in Canada. And that was a very interesting life. And your company is in West Lothian? My company was the Lothian Engineering Company in Whitburn, West Lothian, yeah. Excellent, thank you. How did you get involved with St John Scotland? Well, I, my local church was in Whitburn, and when I moved to Terfichan, uh, I joined the local church here in the village, and the Reverend Tom Crichton uh, was the minister there, and uh, it was the Reverend Tom that encouraged me to uh, join the West Lothian St John Association back in 1987, and it just all progressed from there. Was Reverend Crichton a member of St John's Club? Reverend Tom Crichton was the prelate of the order, and he ended. He, he left the church in Terfican and became the chaplain to St John's Hospital in uh, Livingston. But he was a knight, he was a knight in the order. Yeah. What are your first memories of being involved with St John's Scotland? What did I do? I basically, I, I just attended the, the, the sort of meetings and the activities that were taking place at that particular time. Uh, little garden fets and so on and so forth. The, 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 there was not an awful lot of fundraising went on. So it, with, it was within the, their own circle of, of people, basically. They, they weren't trying to encourage an expansion of, the, of the, the, their activities. How did your involvement progress? Well, uh, I got involved on the committee with the association and then over the years I was promoted to, uh, I started off with doing fundraising and then I was promoted to vice chairman and then I took on the chairman's job. Uh, I've given you the, I think you've got the details of it uh, and it just all progressed from there. Can you tell me about some of the fundraising activities that you were involved with? Uh, well, <coughs> we, 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 we regularly run cabaret evenings um, where we, we have some fundraising and we get a guest artist and stuff like that. We, we've done a, a whiskey trail exercise with a, a, a series of, uh, you know, a pound a go sort of thing and it's a you can raise a couple of hundred quids in that direction. Um, we do, uh, we, we still up until COVID, we had a regular uh, Robert Burns tribute evening and we had the uh, Christmas evening activities. Um, and we, at the previous house, not here, uh, at the beaches, we had a, an annual garden fete, which was a, a nice fundraiser, and which we will be doing uh, at, the, at the farmhouse here in the near future when things settle down a bit better. Um, um, basically, that's sort of it. Excuse my ignorance, could you explain the Whiskey Trail fundraiser for me? The what? The Whiskey Trail fundraiser. The Whiskey Trail, is basically, it's just a card where you have something like about 100 brands of malt whiskies and there's one of the malt whiskies is actually the winning prize, right? So it's a pound a go. So you maybe sell two or three sheets. Uh, so you've got about 300 quid and you maybe have a, a nice 40 pound bottle of malt whiskey going to the winning name that's on the card. That's basically it. So it, it worked very well, actually. It does very well. What kind of acts do you have at the cabarets? What kind of artists? Yes. Well, we have the, the local uh, artists who, for example, uh, there's a local chap who does very, very well, a bloke called Paul Phillips, who's a well-known entertainer. And we also have a couple of female artists that come along and do the cabaret for us. And uh, then we have, a, uh, we have a raffle, which usually consists of a hamper and various other sort of things of that nature. So they can... Our cavalry evenings can generally generate anything up to six, seven, maybe eight hundred pounds. Garden fets, my garden fet could always make upwards of a thousand pounds. So this is this is quite good. That must take a lot of organisation. Well, yeah, 
And then, of course, we have the custodianship of the preceptory through uh, Historic Scotland. And we cover that uh, from April to September. And I have about 25 volunteers who take part on the rota, which is very, very good. And it was wonderful also when we have our prior and his wife Sue also taking part in the rota, which is always nice to see the, the boss leading from the front. Uh, so to speak. Yeah. Do the volunteers all come from West Lothian? No, we have uh, we have a few volunteers from the Edinburgh area, and uh, we have uh, a couple of volunteers from the Glasgow area, along with, uh, pr but principally West Lothian. What ages would you say they are? Age group, they would be early fifties upwards. I would say. We've got a f one or two um, under 50 years of age, but I, I find that uh, recruiting volunteers for our activities, you're looking at people who have had early retirement and stuff like that, where they've got a bit of time to spend. The younger people are pretty well tied up pursuing their, their working activities, and they've got family commitments and so on and so forth. That's, uh, that's, why I, I, that, that's my view. Uh, that uh, recruiting can be quite difficult. Uh, what do you think could be done to improve your numbers? Um, <clears throat> I think what we're doing at present uh, to broaden the base of St John activity by our CPR and public access cabinet development, CPR training, um, we in West Lothian have been struggling a bit, but we've got a few outlets that, that, that are coming to fruition. Uh, we now have on board as our team leader on CPR, Margaret Greer, and Margaret was the commanding officer of 12, 1271 Squadron Air Cadets, very well up to the mark on uh, first aid and CPR activity. So she's going to be our lead for our CPR activities. And we have about seven volunteers at the moment. We also have eight volunteers for our NHS blood transfusion activities. And at our last AGM, I've generated a bit of interest. We're trying to set up approximately six vehicles to do a dialysis tra transport to St. John's for the patients there. So that, that's all in the offing. Obviously, we've been tied but up with, with, with the, the COVID activities. It's, restricted our movements quite quite badly, but uh, that, that's for the future. And we have about five projects that we intend to do for our 75th anniversary. We're going to have a wine testing in the preceptory. We're hoping to do, I'll be doing a garden fete. We've got our Lord Lieutenant who's going to do uh, a sponsored walk. And we've got our local committee member who's also a local councillor, Harry Cartmill, is going to be doing Ben Lomond. And uh, my fundraising officer, my new fundraising officer, he's going to be doing Hadrian's Wall. So we've, we've got quite a few things uh, in the pipeline that uh, we should create a bit of activity. And also, there are three civic weeks in Bathgate, Linlithgow and Whitburn, and we intend to set up a St John's stall there for on, on other particular days to do a, a St John's activities and do a bit of CPR and stuff like that and generally project the activities of uh, St John's Scotland. Do you think St John's Scotland is well known amongst the public? <clears throat> St John's Scotland in West Lothian they always thought that we were associated with St John's Hospital, and that we didn't have the. We weren't giving them a broad enough base. We weren't. It's awareness. It's the, it's, it's the principal thing, and this is what uh, the group at HQ are trying to do now. Uh, and they've got a marvellous team in there, and to try and broaden the the, the the base of St John's Scotland, and awareness being the, the, the sort of principal uh, requisite, which I feel even across the board. It hasn't been done uh, over a period of time. Why do you think that was? Um, 
Well, I would rather not say. I've got my own views on that. I, I, I wouldn't want to offend anyone. But okay. If, uh, um, just to take you back to when you joined St John's Scotland, which was 35 years ago. Yeah, 87. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> cuckoo cock. <laughs> it was only confirming the date. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, sorry, so when when you joined um, St John Scotland, could you tell me a bit more about that? Um, you mentioned that you went to lots of meetings and things. Well, we went. We, we held a, a committee meeting maybe once every three months. Then you were at the annual general meeting uh, once a year. And usually uh, Tom would try and encourage someone within the St John's organisation to come along and, and, and give us a, a talk on what they were up to and their activities uh, and that sort of thing. What do you know about other activities that were taking place at that time? Was Scottish Mountain Rescue one of your activities? Uh, Scottish Mountain Rescue was uh, on the go at that particular time, yeah, because Sir James Stirling... Uh, was one of the, the the principal motivators of of the the, uh, the mountain rescue groups, and then we had uh, Archie Russell, who uh, founded the Archie Russell Court, the the respite home in Polmont. Uh, Archie was initially a member of Turfigan, and then he, with his business, he he, he got associated with the central region. But uh, no, West Lothian's activities were relatively limited at that particular time. Uh, they, but the, 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 the people done the best that they could, the, what they thought was, was taking the, the, the thing forward. Who was around in St John Scotland organisation at that time? Um, well, we had Jack Smith, who wrote the initial history book, for the 25th anniversary, and his wife, Effie, they were involved. Then we had uh, the, the Johnson family, uh, George and Moira. They're, George is an officer, Moira is a commander of the order. But they seem to have drifted away. And the people that are uh, in the West Lothian Committee now are all relatively newcomers to the order. Would you say in the past five, ten years? Then the, over the past ten years, yes. Yeah. Mm. We did have a, a an association uh, in St John's Hospital, Livingston. They had they had an association, and um, Ian Wallace was the chair of that particular association. And then, when they started streamlining the St John's organisation and forming the areas, then Ian took the position as uh, area chairman and I took the position as vice chairman and it, it just progressed from there. What were your responsibilities at that time? Well, I, I, I took on the, the, the sort of fundraising and the publicity side and uh, also the preceptory rota. Yeah, so that. You spend a lot of time at the preceptory? Uh, during the summer months, yes. We, we, we were pretty well... You know, I, I tend to keep myself to the side as a stand-in if there are any hiccups, although we do a regular visit, and Ian is the same. Between Ian and I, <coughs> we cover the, the preceptory rota and also any tours uh, that take place, and weddings and that sort of stuff, you know. We're trying, to we're trying to increase the wedding activity. We've had quite a few inquiries recently, uh, and uh, they, they, they seem relatively positive because we get a £500 income from that which is a nice uh, cash generator. And then the Historic Scotland, <coughs> we get the, the, the key-keeping fee for that, which is approximately £2,500 a year. So it's, it's quite nice to, to, to have that. It's, it's a nice money spinner. And we have some interesting visits as well from various groups. We had uh, the 700th anniversary. We had the, the, uh, the, the Clan Wallace people from America and then we had groups from Australia. And then on a regular basis, we have all sorts of people coming from China, uh, America, the Far East. It's, it's, it's a very interesting spread of visits. And I think possibly when Dan Brown wrote his Da Vinci Code on the, 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 the Rosalind Chapel thing, 
uh, generated interest in our part of the world as well. Because invariably we quite a number of people who have been to Roslyn Chapel and then come to Turfigan, which is, is quite nice. And then we also have the, the, uh, the Korean War Memorial uh, up the top of the hill, uh, at the top of the village, which is regularly attended. And again, they come to Turfican. And we get, and we did up until the COVID, we had uh, first year students from Glasgow University, the archaeological department, and we would have about 170 students and five coaches. And uh, Ian and I would cover that uh, when they uh, done their visit, which is interesting. And some of the really interesting questions you get asked there, because the children from various parts of the world, and they would leave the preceptory and go up to the ancient monument at Cairn Papal, and then they would go from there to Linlithgow Palace and see the birthplace of Mary, Queen of Scots, and all that sort of thing. Yeah, good. Could you tell me a bit about the history of the preceptory? Uh, the history, well, it goes back to the First and Second Crusades, um, the, the time of Mary, Queen of Scots, uh, that's the 16th century. We had the, the present-day Lord Terficken lives in uh, Calder, Mid Calder House, or Mid Calder House in Mid Calder, I beg your pardon. Uh, he doesn't attend any of our activities in the preceptory, but um, it's uh, being 11th century. It's, it's, it's got. We had the, the initially the Templar people were here before the Hospitallers. There are temple gravestones in the village in in the graveyard. One of the lintel stones in the preceptory is of a temple headstone. I'm involved in that side of uh, the. Uh, activities as well in temple Freemasonry, um, along with their hospital work. But uh, prior to the Battle of Falkirk, the Scottish army was camped in the field adjacent to the preceptory, 1298. Then when Edward arrived at Kirkliston, Wallace moved his army to Shield Hill near Falkirk. Uh, Wall um, Edward, who injured himself at Loch Court, was tended to by the monks uh, at the preceptory. Um, we had uh, the preceptor at that time was um, Alexander de Wells, and there was a, another chap came up with 40 Welsh mercenaries, a chap called Brian Leger, uh, who was intended to fight on the Scottish side but ended up fighting on the English side. De Wells and Leger were both killed at Falkirk. Uh, when Sir Walter Scott wrote Ivanhoe, he used Brian Leger as his protege because he had the St John's drape on his horse and on his shield he had the, the raven at the top and the skull at the base. The raven being the hill of the, the raven, being Torfecken, being the hill of the hen, and the skull depicts the skull at the base of Golgotha at Mount Calvary where Jesus was crucified. So that's, that's a very interesting uh, book if, for anyone to read. And I'm sure most of you have seen the, the wonderful picture of Ivanhoe. That's amazing. <laughs> well, it's quite a lot of interesting stuff. Uh, the Sandylands people were very well figured in the Crusades. Uh, there is one of the Sandy Lands, who was a Scottish knight, was imprisoned in uh, Grandmaster's dungeon in the palace of Grandmaster, uh, in Grandmaster's palace in Valletta because he obje objected to certain goings on that, uh, that he was executed. He and another knight, uh, the Sandy Lands family. Uh, uh, the Templar people were basically mercenaries, and if you're travelling the Holy Land, you would give them your gold. And they would give you tokens, and then if you arrive at the Holy Land, then you would get your gold back, and you surrender your tokens. And then Clementine the Fourth and Philip the Fair of France, they realised that the Templars were becoming terribly wealthy people, uh, and uh, so they they burned uh, Jack de Molay and Hugo de, Hugo de Pion at the stake in Paris in eleven thirteen, uh, and. They, Disbanded the Templars, 
and then the the Knights Hospitallers uh, came into creation, uh, and they established Eye Hospital in Jerusalem, which is still very very much in St John's uh, activity and fundraising of disbursements uh, each year. We we disperse uh, at the end of last year we disperse two thousand pounds to the eye hospital, two thousand pounds to the food bank in West Lothian, five hundred pounds to the military museum uh, at the uh, Lindburn, and five hundred pounds to the uh, Seagull Trust, which again was set up by H. R. P. Mackay, who was the minister in the village here. He founded the Seagull Trust at Rathall. Uh, just last week, last Thursday, we gave a further £2,000 to West Lothian Food Bank, which we felt that uh, with the oncoming winter, it's going to be terribly difficult for an awful lot of people. Uh, they were overwhelmed at our donation. Uh, we done that last Thursday. Who decides who the donations should go to? The, the committee. It's, it's, a, it's a, a committee decision for any disbursement of funds. Um, likewise, uh, we, in my, my chairman's report, I emphasised that we, we, the importance of our CPR and defibrillator uh, projects and um, <coughs> that we were delighted to welcome as a team leader um, the uh, um, Margaret Greer. And uh, we also have uh, Kenny uh, McMaster, who's going to be a publicity officer. He's very keen on the CPR stuff and he'll be doing uh, publicity work for that. Uh. Just going back to the preceptory for a, a moment, um, there's a church right next door as yep. well, which you also look after. Yes. Can you tell me some of the St John Scotland activities that take place in the preceptory and the church? Well, in the early days, uh, prior to historic Scotland, taking on uh, and restoring the preceptory to its present uh, standard, the services were held in the church. And they were held in the church up until quite recently. Uh, it was Sir Malcolm Ross was the initial motivator to have the services in the preceptory rather than the church. And Mark was keen, very keen during his tenure of office to have the services in the preceptory proper, which my personal view is the proper place for it. But in the church, the stalls are suitably marked for all the, the senior officers of St John, because up until recent times, the service was always held. The annual service for the martyrdom of St John the Baptist was always held in, in the church. That was another thing I, was, I meant to mention, Sue. We we're, were hoping at the 75th to involve all the areas and have an open weekend and have stalls and, and various things, uh, hopefully. I know, I know that, that uh, Edinburgh people will be quite supportive of that and uh, Fife is, uh, will be quite supportive of that, hopefully central. How many people from other areas do you actually get to meet? How often? Well, we principally meet at the investiture and then we also have a commemorative service for the martyrdom of St John the Baptist on the last Sunday in August and most of the areas attend that. Uh, not in any great numbers, I may say, but uh, and Mark was always trying very hard to expand upon that, uh, but then geographically uh, it's a lot to ask people to travel from Inverness and Aberdeen uh, and the southwest of Scotland and southeast of Scotland to come up for a, a two hour service sort of style, whereas at the investiture you have the sort of civic reception, so you've got the evening before you have your official investiture. So generally people come and stay in a local hotel and make a, a two-day or a three-day visit, whereas just for the, 
the preceptory in uh, the preceptory service. It's a lot to ask, possibly, for uh, an afternoon. Uh. What are your favourite memories of being involved with St John's Scotland? Favourite memories is having the honour of uh, representing West Lothian at Her Majesty's Garden Party in Holyrood. <laughs> Uh, I've done that on a couple of occasions, and uh, that's one of the, the highlights of my uh, activity with Sir John Scotland. Although I did represent uh, West Lothian Industry at one time as well at the, the Garden Party, but uh, uh, and I, I, I had also the wonderful experience of attending the memorial service for Sir Malcolm Ross in St George's Chapel in Windsor, which I guess was quite a daunting experience as well, having never been uh, in Windsor Castle or in uh, the St George's Chapel. Uh, it was very nice to, to, to represent St John there. What would you say the challenges have been for you in the past? <clears throat> the challenges is, like every other organisation, is encouraging volunteers to give up their time or some of their time to promote the interests and the, the projects of St John. That, that, it, it, it's becoming more, increasingly more difficult to recruit people uh, and rely on them to give you support. I mean, that's been a, it's a hereditary problem. It's been during my 30 years. It's, it's, it, nothing has changed. Uh, I'm fortunate that... Uh, have managed to encourage people uh, that are relatively motivated in, in our St John's direction. And I think that the, the CPR uh, development and the DFIB uh, development will uh, hopefully, I think, could encourage a younger, a younger element of our community to take part and become volunteers. We have had one or two, but the, 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 with COVID coming in, We've been at a standstill, basically, for the past two years, um, which is extremely difficult for, for everyone, financially uh, in particular. And, and, and I don't think that the, there's an awful lot of organisations will, will suffer and will have difficulty in recovering to full speed, I would say, in the next two or three years. I know that other organisations that I'm involved in they are, they are very anxious uh, about how things are going to go forward. Have you managed to keep, keep in touch with all the volunteers of the past? Oh yes, years? oh yes, oh yes. Yeah, yeah. We have regular communications. Yeah. yeah. Is that online? Yeah, we've been doing it online and telephones. Of course, I, I, I'm involved in another order where we uh, I look after some medical, medically infirm people and whatnot and. I'm in touch with them and I tend to phone around and talk to my committee people on a regular basis. Yeah. If COVID allows and the pandemic actually ends or diminishes somewhat more anyway, um, do you think it would be um, a good idea to try and get some younger people involved? Perhaps school, starting with youngsters? Well, my view is it's paramount that we get younger people involved because that is your future. If, 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 I mean, it's like the church. The Church of Scotland is in dire streets and I'm the Presbytery Elder for the church and I was Commissioner to the Assembly this year uh, and they are in serious trouble because they, 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 they have not kept up with the times. They have not encouraged and made it more attractive for youth and younger people to become involved and, and, and other organisations I'm involved in, it's the same problem. They, they, they're all of retiring age or retirable age and there's a massive cross-section of St John membership are 70 plus. And we, you know, I would say if you could get people late 40s, early 50s who've had early retirement, as I said already, um, you've got a good 10, 15 years uh, activity, potential activity from them. But if you can get the 
30, 25 to 35 year olds interested, then that, that is a serious step forward for the future. I mean, we, we have the, the air cadets who will be doing a backpack for us. That was another thing I omitted to mention uh, for the 75th. And Margaret being the, the squadron leader for 1271, but she now has a number of areas under her control. Uh, and uh, it's that sort of age group that we would like to try and uh, encourage. We also have a machine gun platoon uh, in uh, Bathgate, who I hope to approach in the near future to see if we can get them interested in doing something and maybe have a joint thing. And then <clears throat> we also are involved with the West Lothian Scouts and we funded them to send a, a couple of groups out to Malawi to do uh, holiday activities there uh, and establishing a freshwater well building a schoolhouse and stuff like that. So, and, you know, and, and I have the uh, district commissioner uh, down as a supporter now for St John. My daughter, she is a supporter for St John's. She's in education at Mulbardi Primary School. And we're going to be looking at getting the primary children geared up for CPR, PAD activities. And Harry Cartmill who's a local councillor, he's our representative for Bathgate Academy and we're hoping to get things moving there on CPR and PAD activity. Again, it's COVID's been... But then we can blame COVID for so much, but <coughs> it, uh, COVID's, COVID is not going away. COVID is going to be here and we're going to have to readjust to suit um, and I think you'll be having a regular COVID jag along with your influenza jag annually and we just have to get on with it and pick up the threads and do what we've got to do. Do you have um, anything in mind about potentially which activities might attract young people? Um, I think Younger people like to be hands-on, so I, I, I would say that I'm going to try and get the younger people to man our gazebo stalls at the Civic Week activities in Whitburn, Bathgate and Lillithgow for the 75th. Uh, hopefully we will get the cadets involved in our activities at the Preceptory. And I'll be looking at the the army cadet people as well and see what we can do there and the scouts see what we can do there have a presence and try and uh, broaden that base in that area have you ever you, done anything like um stage a uh, focus group amongst the young people and the what group focus group no to no. see what kind of things they would like to do no no i haven't, I haven't pursued that. No. that that could be a, that could be a possibility yeah yeah. See, I, I, my view is that if you look at the cadets, the army and the air force and the scouting movement, that's the group or the area where children are brought up with a relative degree of responsibility, uh, the correct attitude and how to attire oneself. We, we suffer very badly across the whole of the country, across the UK, uh, complete lack of discipline, where you have the scouting movement, army cadets, air cadets, they've been taught basic disciplines and basic attitudes towards your fellow man. Uh, I think that a lot depends on their upbringing in the home. There's a great lack nowadays of discipline within the home. So the teaching profession, my daughter, she's in the administration in the teaching profession. Um, very, very difficult. Uh, there, there is no school discipline whatsoever. And um, likewise, our constabulary find it very difficult out in the field. Um, 
you, you, you're, you're fighting against all these adverse conditions. It's the, 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 the younger people that are available uh, at a minimum. It's attitude. I mean, I, I talk to young people in other areas and uh, do you have a tie? I never wore a tie. Do you have a suit of clothes? I've never had a suit of clothes. Do you have a pair of shoes? All I have is training shoes. I rest my case. <laughs> Simple discipline. The schools are try the schools are trying to implement discipline. And you know, we have the my daughter's school, is the uniform is mandatory and collar and tie. And and that that is they're getting the right areas of teaching. But whenever they go to the sort of senior grades or whenever they move away from that, uh, they, they lose. The, uh, it's, my daughter was volunteering during the summer holidays for school lunches uh, and they were actually having to deliver them because the parents wouldn't come to the school for the, the kids' lunches. And some of the situations that my daughter encountered it was quite, uh, quite interesting, to say the least. Doing all the wrong things in life, and children are having to suffer the, the depravity, and that's why we have an expanding food bank, which in the United Kingdom, in 2021, having the fifth or sixth richest economy, uh, there's something not quite correct. But I think it's within the family structure itself where uh, groups of people are pursuing all their own forms of social activity. Uh, substance abuse, alcohol, all that sort of stuff. That's on the, that's on the up and up. Uh, so that tends to reflect on the younger element in the groups that are available, unfortunately. Um. Moving away from the young um, and back to your early involvement with St John's Scotland, um, can you tell me any good stories? Is there any story that sticks in your mind? With regards to? Anything. Activities, people? Uh, no, but We've always had a few laughs. <laughs> but, uh, uh, no, it's. I find, well, sometimes at my my local garden fete, I always remember there was a couple of our people tumbled into the pond through. <laughs> yes, trying to catch a goldfish or something like that with the kids. We used to do the. We'd we, we done the. the um, the, what do they call the ducks in the pond and with the ducks down the stream and it wasn't uncommon for the people who were running the ducks down the stream to end up in the stream <laughs> you get a few laughs with that and I always remember a, a lad that was doing the hamburger stall uh, tried to have a shot at one of the uh, ducks and uh, he went headlong into the pond and that was one of the the highlights of the day. <laughs> yeah. And Liam Hackett was always a, a regular visitor at our fets and Liam would come along with his pipes at the end of the afternoon and give us a, a bit on his uh, the, the Irish pipes and then our local order piper would come and play us some music in the afternoon and that sort of stuff. But... Uh, no, that's just but nothing terribly untoward, I would have thought. But. What are your hopes for St John Scotland moving forward? I, I will be standing down as chairman after our St John's, the Baptist service, at the end of August 22. And I hope to leave the area in a very healthy position. Uh, I've got every confidence in our Vice Chairman, Athol McInnes, who will be heading uh, the thing up. 
Uh, I've now got my publicity officer in place. I've got my fundraising officer in place. And I've got my CPR officer in place. And Ian Wallace and I, we will undertake... I do the rota, and Ian Wallace and I will do the t conducted tours and so on and so forth. We do have, and I've still to pursue that area, <laughs> uh, Trafalgar Tours have started bringing coach loads back again to Terfiken Inn. Uh, we do use the Terfiken Inn for our afternoon tea after St John the Baptist service. It's under new ownership. And I would like to expand on that because there's a coach load of something like 45 people, which we did do before, uh, a few years back, giving them a tour of the preceptory during the summer months. There's something like about three coaches a week will be coming into the village. Uh, I wouldn't look to charge them the £2.50 at the gate, uh, but negotiate uh, a figure acceptable to the Trafficking In people and acceptable to my committee, uh, and we would man it and give them an evening tour uh, during the summer months, which is, would be a wonderful generator. In fact, it, it, it has the potential of exceeding our custodial uh, key picking, a uh, key keeping fee, which uh, is another little area that I'd like to expand on. But no, I, I think I think uh, I'll still be in the background, and uh, we'll, 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 Ian and I will still be voicing from the wilderness uh, if things don't happen. You don't hand it over and just uh, you got to make sure it's. It, it, the biggest problem is motivation across the board. But that, that's, that's, I've been used to that most of my life. And so has he been in the medical profession and uh, being a senior surgeon in St. John's Livingston. He knows what motivation is all about as well. In a different, in a different way. I mean, I'm, I'm more rougher, rougher at the edges than he is, but uh, I can get my point across. <laughs> Simple as that. But no, no, I mean, the uh, fundraising, disbursements, uh, West Lothian area being the smallest, I think last year we led the field in disbursements. I know uh, that I did mention at our festival that we haven't opened any doors this year and we've raised £6,250. Because we had a wonderful open day via our prior, who raised £3,200 for his open garden day. Ian Wallace had an open garden day and raised £1,000. Then we had a supporter who's now went into the wine business and he gave us a donation of £1,000. Harry Cartmill uh, done a kilt walk raised some £500 and I done uh, a birthday sponsor uh, on Facebook and that raised about £500 then we had a donation so without any serious fundraising we have still raised well it is serious fundraising uh, but we haven't really opened up officially yet so it's been wonderful uh, Ian and uh, Mark's contribution was for the Eye Hospital in Jerusalem. Um, we allocated Oleg's £1,000 to our CPR PAD activity. My birthday bash thing, birthday sponsor thing for our CPA activity. And Harry's kilt walk stuff will be going to CPR stuff. So. No, I think we'll do quite well. Next year I'm going to be doing a birthday bash for St John's being 50 years married and 80 years of age. The last one I'd done at 70, we raised about 1,500 quid, so I'm hoping that uh, I'll be selective on who I invite. <laughs> and we'll, but no, I, th I think uh, our 75th will be, but we'll make every effort anyway that we can. 
Um, would you like to say a few words about Mark and his good lady Sue? Mark, uh, Mark Strudwick was one of the nicest priors that I have had the honour and privilege of working with. Um, I knew briefly uh, Viscount Arbuthnet, uh, Sir James Stirling I knew relatively well, uh, Sir Malcolm Ross, lovely gentleman, and Mark took over the reins from Sir Malcolm. Uh, Malcolm laid the foundation stone for our strategy, and uh, Mark has excelled in every area of expanding St John, Scotland, and he set up a new administration team headed up with uh, Angus Loudon, who's an exceptional uh, chief executive officer, and the team that he has working with him uh, have been first class. And I'm sure that the new uh, recruits will be equally uh, supportive of what's going on in St John, Scotland. And, uh, and, and I think that uh, Mark uh, will be a very, very difficult person to replace. Um, he was a regular attendee at the kiosk along with Sue, um, doing preceptory rota. And he was a very, very busy man, but made time for that. Uh, at his own expense and Sue's expense, they planted out all the gardens at the preceptory. They did a beautiful job of that. They also produced the new terrific and history book at their own expense. And I've managed to sell about 45 copies already, just from here. Uh, so, and that, that'll be on sale through the preceptory. A uh, beautiful publication, uh, very informative, and uh, I think it'll go down very, very well. But uh, I was actually, I was, I was shocked at the bad news, because he did attend here mid-July uh, for a half hour that ended up an afternoon with Sue, and we had a wonderful time out in the garden here at the farmhouse, and uh, as a person, uh, a true Christian gentleman, and, I would, and having his, looking at his military career and his achievements there, uh, being a past keeper of the castle and headed up Children's Trust. Uh, we, we, we couldn't have had a, a better prayer. But I'm sure that uh, Eleanor Argyle will follow in his footsteps. She may not be as uh, attentive, attentive to the or, or, or attendance may not be as much as Mark was at the perception, but bearing in mind that Mark only lives three miles from the preceptory and it's much easier to, to attend the, what's going on there. But I'm sure uh, she, she, and, and another interesting thing and a wonderful thing that Mark done, first time in the history of St John, was that he invested Eleanor Argyle in the preceptory proper, which is the first time that happened. Very limited affair limited in numbers, but um, very, very nice and beautifully done. And um, yeah, it was marvellous to see him doing that. It was a big miss to me, because I had a lot, of, very high regard. I thought, I thought that he, he'd, he'd done a wonderful job. In my, my 35 years, uh, in my personal view, he's been exceptional. And his team that is set in place, I'm sure they'll take St John without any problem forward. They've had, had their, their problems and Everybody has and the econ economics of things, and you know it's not easy. Again, you've got to try and get your officers out there to encourage the younger element, and it's it's not easy. I mean, Liz Crawford's been a wonderful person; she's now retired, and uh, you know it's, it's, it's. But the 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 new people I met at the festival, and they're they're very positive, and I'm having uh, Claire along with our new area. Uh, officer uh, visiting tomorrow, so that that'd be nice. They're coming tomorrow. So we'll set out our stall and see what we can do from there. Yeah. Thank you very much, Keith. Appreciate My you taking pleasure. the time.